everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, so today we are going to talk about um, uh, DFIR in container and how we can do DFIR in the in-container world. Uh, so let's start introducing ourselves. Uh, I'm Stefano and I'm a threat research lead, ma uh, lead manager and at Sysdig. Um, as you can see from the picture, I'm uh, from uh, Milano, Italy. Um, here is Alberto uh, Pelisteri. He's a, a, a security researcher at Sysdig and he comes from uh, uh, Turin, uh, Italy as well. F and he works from uh, at Sysdig as well. So uh, for who doesn't know Sysdig, uh, Sysdig is a, a container and, and a cloud security company. Uh, Sysdig donated FICO, uh, a runtime security project uh, at in, uh, uh, to the CNCF back in 2016 and is now the um, a sandbox runtime security project at the incubation level and is, and is in the process to, uh, to become uh, a graduated process. Talking about FICO, uh, we are both uh, FICO contributors uh, and are also active in uh, uh, FICO community and I'm also a FICO reviewer for uh, FICO rules. Uh, here is the agenda for today. Uh, so we're going to talk about the FIR, uh, especially uh, in, we are going to see incident response and uh, digital forensic. And then we are going to cover and uh, refer to uh, NIST um, incident response life cycle. And then Alberto will go through um, some uh, DFIR container uh, methodology, techniques, uh, and also tools, specific tools for DFIR in containers uh, with some demos, and then we will wrap up the session with some uh, main takeaways. So let's start. Uh, let's start talking about DFIR. Um, as we know, DFIR put together uh, two different areas, uh, digital forensic and uh, incident response. Uh, as we know, digital forensics focus uh, more on uh, collecting and analyzing uh, uh, data, user activities, and other piece of uh, digital evidence uh, to, to, un to um, understand what happened on a, um, on a machine or, wha or who may be behind a specific threats on or, or the specific attack uh, or uh, uh, whatever we recorded in our environment. All these activities need to be done uh, following best practice and specific methodology to maintain the chain of custody uh, so that the evidence are, are legitimate and can be used and presented to the court in case of legal proceedings. Incident response instead uh, are more are focused on preparing, detecting, containing, and recovering from a, a data breach or a, or a security incident. Uh, in early years, in early days, um, as we know, uh, these two processes were uh, completely different and separated. Uh, however, I mean, of course, because th uh, they have different goals, but uh, tools, processes, methodologies uh, are pretty similar. And now with tools like EDR, XDR, uh, that are evolved, uh, of course, um, they empower the incident responder to do further actions like uh, proceeding with the investigation and also performing other actions. So it makes sense now to uh, put them together under the, the, under the same head uh, and referring directly to DFIR. Uh, and when we talk about uh, DFIR, we used to refer to the, to, to the NIST incident response um, life, life uh, cycle step. And here are the four main, uh, main steps that are pretty well known. Of course, today we are not covering all the uh, technical and non-technical uh, aspects from, from NIST. I leave the, um, the link behind in the, in the slide so that you can uh, check out the, uh, the, NIST, the official NIST documentation if you are interested and you want to know more about it. Um, and of course, uh, today we are, we are gonna cover the uh, technical aspect on how we can do the FIR in containers which are the techniques, the specific techniques that we need to know in order to do that in, in container worlds. And so this is the time of the presentation where we start saying the best practices and yeah, it's sh sure, you need to follow the best practice and you need to check for misconfiguration, right? So I know it's kind of boring, but we need to do that. So uh, jokes apart, um, when we talk about incident response plan, 
uh, it's always important to mention that these need to be prepared in advance. It's fundamental. Uh, attacker uh, aren't, aren't going to ask you if you are ready to receive an attack or, uh, I don't know, we are in, so uh, are you aware that we are already in your environment? So we need to be prepared of that. And, and we, we, need, uh, we, know, uh, we need also to keep in mind that most of the, or part of the uh, incident response plan are non-technical. So there are some aspects like uh, contacts, people contacts, uh, people that need to be involved, uh, needs to be defined in advance, and people from different teams, they, need, they specifically need to know which people they need to contact and, and exactly what they need to do in specific and which action they need to do. So all these aspects are not are more processes and is not technical or related, but is something that it needs to be set. And, and of course, if we talk about technical aspect, as we said, uh, there are specific tools that, that we need to run and, and the list of the tool required might be uh, set in advance. And also uh, all the knowledge about how to use the tool or uh, I don't know, specific flag that you need to use, uh, they need to be, all the knowledge should be uh, prepared and to be there before the attack. Because of course we can't uh, spend time on understanding how this tool work or, oh yeah, I need this tool to, uh, to do, I don't know, a, 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 an image, a forensic uh, image of something and we need to understand how the tool works and all this, stuff, and all this kind of activities. So uh, timing is fundamental and we need to be prepared. And of course, even if you have a, an incident response plan set, we need to make sure, and you need to make sure that this is up to date. I mean, people change in companies, uh, tools change pretty quickly, as we know. Uh, so all the list of tools that need to be used should be updated frequently, and also the people that need to uh, be involved need to be um, uh, updated frequently as well. Okay, that's fine. So we covered what we need to what we need to say, and of course, um, the, uh, the FIR is a pretty uh, well-known practice and well-known methodologies. And today we are not go going to cover the well-known tools um, that, of course, are still valid for containers. So we are not saying they are not useful uh, anymore. Of course, they are, but they are pretty well-known, and we are just want to cover and we're just to focus on specific tools that can be used on, uh, on containers, so to do the FIR activities in containers. This happens also in other technologies like IoT or ICS, if you think about it. There are specific tools that need to be known and need to be um, used in order to perform some activities on the FIR. So let's start talking about the FIR uh, in containers. So we all know containers and we are pretty familiar with them and we like a lot. Uh, it's super easy to deploy code, it's super easy to uh, ship code that we want in our environment and deploy it. So of course we know all the advantages that container can bring, but of course we also know that there are some challenging that we need to face. And especially for the FIR, um, we know that containers are um, uh, dynamic, and are ephemeral, so doing activities like the FIR in such a, a, a dynamic environment could be pretty challenging, and of course we need to uh, respond as quick as possible because some activities that Alberto will show now uh, needs to be done when uh, the container is live and need to be uh, there. And we know containers are, uh, are ephemeral and, and, super, uh, and super quick to, uh, to destroy and we might miss some uh, information. So it's really important to uh, gather this information and, and then perform all other activities. So I let Alberto uh, deep dive into uh, the FIR and all the techniques and tools to use. Thank you, Stefano, and hello, everyone. Um, so for this presentation, we want also to uh, adopt a practical approach covering the previous steps that we have seen about NIST incident resp response plan. And to do so, we are going to cover all of those steps outlining the main aspects uh, that may be useful in the containerization world and along with tools, techniques, and so on and so forth. And so for this reason, let's begin from 
preparation. So preparation is, man, is maybe one of the main aspects of incident response methodologies because a good preparation allows you to not only prevent the incident, but by hardening, I mean, your environment, but also to enforce the right capabilities so that an organization is ready to respond quickly. We can talk about facilities, communications, hardware, software, whatever you want, but we're going to skip all the organizative and traditional steps like set a war room or plan on site calls and so on and so forth. Uh, but we're going to focus our attention on open source tools that can help incident response team to detect red flags, facilitate attacks investigations and response. So the first tool, um, I mean, the first kind of tool that I want to, um, I mean, to, to stress is contain, container runtime security tool. Um, Falco is maybe the first CNCF uh, runtime security tool that allows you to spark threats at runtime. Um, see whenever there are some kind of threats that are running in your Linux environment, in your containers, and also to spot uh, audit logs and some kind of resources and requests that are made to the Kubernetes API server. So you may want to spot this kind of threats at runtime. You may also want to adopt, adopt other kind of open source tools and CNCF graduated projects like Prometheus in order to monitor your resources and see if there are some pickup loads, network uh, changes that may be relevant for your investigations or also some other solutions like logging solutions because one of the main best practices and that you need to enforce during the preparation step is also to log, uh, I mean, as much as you can from your applications so that you can, uh, I mean, try to have all the kind of information that are needed and then with tools like Fluentbit and Fluentd, you can try to forward these um, logs ingest them, parse them, so that you can have all of them with, for example, Falco Alerts in one single logging management platform, like the Arc Stack, that is another open source project, like OpenSearch, and so on and so forth. So, in order to address the failure in containers in a realistic way, we're going to adopt Kubernetes, because I think that most of you are familiar with it, and also because uh, this is one of the main uh, orchestration tools used by the open source community. And as, I mean, as many of you already know, in Kubernetes we can run, the, we can run pods that embed containers in there, and so uh, we can also perform the FAR in this kind of container. So let's start from the demo that we have set for this presentation. Here we have, in this case, this Kubernetes cluster, where we have few nodes, where we have daemon set like Falco, Fluentbit, and Prometheus in order, to, um, in order to monitor our resources. We are going to forward this kind of alerts to the single logging management platform like Elk Stack. But as you can imagine, in order to perform the FAR in a container, we need a workload that can be exploited and later analyzed. So let's teleport to the past and let's imagine that we are in 2021. I know that you're, you're thinking that I'm going to talk about Log4j because I'm not, I'm bored about it. So let's talk about another vulnerabilities that, he, that was disclosed in 2021 as well, that is the Apache HTTP server. That was a, a path traversal vulnerability that under some circumstances allowed also to perform remote command executions. And so in our cluster, we basically exposed our workload, our Apache HTTP server, with a Kubernetes load balancers that could be exposed by attackers, that could be ex exploited by attackers. So let's now wear the incident response team hat. An incident response team is always monitoring alerts based on Falco detection, um, I mean alerts like the ones based on Falco detection that we said. Uh, to be alerted as soon as possible and to promptly respond to incident. Let's jump into our stack. And in this case here, we have some logs that are related to one of our Apache HTTPD pods where we can find something related to 
launch ingress remote file copy tools in container that is kind of soft speeches. I don't think that uh, it happens every day that there are cool on WGET executions that are run at runtime in your container. So this is a, a red flag. If we go ahead, we can also see some kind of some other kind of alerts like uh, a, spo uh, a shell was spawned by the Apache HTTPD process that is kind of suspicious as well, and also attempts to steal sensitive credentials. But focusing on our, our attention to the uh, launch ingress remote file copy tools in containers, we can see that it was executed a cool wget uh, that tried to reach an endpoint that is related to the IP address that you can see here, 194 and blah, 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 where you uh, were basically, uh, that, that was basically used in order to download a malicious payload that we will see later. So let's now uh, go ahead and let's see also the logs that were forwarded by FluentBit in our log management platform that are related to the impacted pod. If we see the logs, we can see that, for example, there were a bunch of get requests uh, on top of this slide, and then there are also some commands that were not performed uh, successfully. There are also some other kind of, um, I mean, operations that were not permitted, and at the end, if we go ahead, we can also see a post request that is kind of suspicious because it basically tried to, it exploited, it exploited the CGI bin in order to spawn a shell. Um, other suggestions, by the way, may also come from, um, open, from Prometheus, as I said before, because Prometheus uh, allows you to basically, um, for example, query uh, your, your pod that you have in this specific namespace, for example, and you can see, for example, from the uh, memory used that at the beginning there was this normal amount of memory that was, um, uh, I mean, used by the, those pods in that namespace, and at a certain point in time there was this peak of load. I mean, this is just an example also because this also means that I'm a bad programmer because I didn't set resource quota, resource limits in my workload. But there are other kind of indicators like network bytes that may be explanatory for your, for your investigation purpose. So let's now, oh, 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 let's now continue. Come on. Okay, yeah, I love uh, the office. And now th this is one of the main interesting parts because, I mean, incident response team um, should always be prepared to such kind of events and uh, should be able to respond as soon as possible to the alerts that happen. Also because in your uh, orchestration environments or whenever you have a container that has been impacted, you need to respond as soon as possible because as Stefano said before, they are ephemeral. And these kind of containers can disappear and you may lose the kind of information about the attack that uh, happened in your environment. So let's now go ahead and let's talk about the real response that is uh, engaged by the response team. So you may want to contain to, to evaluate their education and also to recover your infrastructure. So contain basically means isolate the attack because you may want to avoid that the affected pods or container may impact other resources. If you are, uh, for example, in a Kubernetes cluster, the pod that was impacted may have access to service account. Those service account may grant you access to some request to the Kubernetes API server. And so, for example, the attack can generate a mess. And of course, you need also to ensure availability and continuity to your, uh, to your resources, to the services that you provide. And you must also assess which resources have been impacted. For example, your containers may cause pod escaping, container escaping, grant to the attackers direct access to the node. And these, of course, can create some other problems. And what is also important for the forensic step is to collection, all the evidences about the attack. So as always, the first and the main step is to always snapshot the worker node volume. 
because these grants, um, some forensics, uh, some forensics analysis uh, that can be done later during the post-mortem phase, but you can also enforce, for example, some other um, commands like commit and push in order to store the container image that was impacted, and also checkpoint the container that we are going to see later. And at the end, of course, last but not least, you should also fix at the end of this step of this uh, containment eradication recovery, fix your, uh, fix the entry point if it was exploited by attackers. Um, so if it is a misconfiguration or a vulnerability, you need to fix it. Otherwise, you have to mitigate if, for example, the patch is not available. So uh, before jumping into the crime investigation scene, um, I would like also only to stress that there are some kind of useful tools and techniques that you may want to engage whenever there are breaches in your containers, but I want also to stress, to stress that many of these tools continuously evolve because there are some kind of tools that, for example, you could use a few years ago in Docker, but these, for example, cannot be used anymore in uh, some kind, in, I mean, up, up to date Kubernetes cluster due to the Docker scheme being deprecated. So there are, uh, of course, you can interact uh, as always with the container engine or with the Kubernetes API server to do some operations that you're going to see in a while. But you may also want to adopt tools like container diff in order to check the differences among two different images or Docker Explorer and Container Explorer in order to check any kind of differences. Uh, uh, I, I mean, in order to recover the state of a previously snapshotted worker node volume uh, so that you can see which were the previously running containers. By the way, that's done. Let's start now from the isolation step. So in this example, for ex uh, as we said, we are in a Kubernetes cluster. And we know which is the pod that was impacted. And the first kind of thing that we want to do is, for example, to label the, the, no, the, the pod and then apply some network policy in order to isolate the pod. In this way, if there was an attacker that, for example, exploited a river shell, it will be cut off the, the pod itself because the, 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 the network policy doesn't allow any kind of ingress or egress traffic. Later, you may want also to cordon the, pod, the node where the pod was scheduled. So in this way, all the new kind of workloads that will be deployed in your cluster will be scheduled elsewhere, so in other nodes. And doing so, you are now able to start some other forensics processes, like for example, snapshot the worker node volume, or uh, restrict the network access to the, um, to the worker node itself. You may want to, for example, remove the IP, the external IP that can be used in order to reach that kind of worker node and create an intermediate VM. But all these kind of steps are mainly related to traditional step. And um, our focus is right now to, to uh, focus, I mean, to, to dig deeper into the investigation of the container itself. So let's now assume that we have enforced some of the steps that I've just mentioned um, and that I'm going into the machine, into the worker node that was, uh, that was scheduled, that has scheduled the impacted pod. So um, we are now into the worker node itself and one of the first thing that we want to do is for example to interact with the container in time um, of course, you must be sure that, for example, there, there was no pod uh, escaping or container escaping, but we are going to see the eradication, um, the eradication step later. But one of the main things that you, you may want to do, for example, without interacting directly with the Kubernetes API server, for example, is to interact directly with the container engine, see which are the logs that we already seen with FluentBit, see which are the running processes. And in this example, you can see at the bottom the Kinsing malware. Um, you can also see that there is, uh, we used also the uh, CPR snapshot diff that 
basically allows you to check which are the changes in the, uh, in the file system. So uh, if, for example, the attackers were able to download some files in the file system and if there were some changes in the file system itself, you can spot them from there. And you can see that in this case, we're engaged the TMP path where they downloaded some suspicious file. You can, of course, uh, commit the impacted container so that you can uh, push that image in a remote, uh, in a remote registry or uh, store it as an archive. This kind of, of, of course, committed and stored image can also be restored later from a sandboxed machine, from an analyzer machine that is isolated from your prod environment. And for example, in some, uh, I mean, some strange other cases, you may, also, you may also want to use ephemeral containers that became stable in version 1.25. And that basically allows you to mainly debug the, the container state or some attacks evidences. They can be useful because um, they are simply some kind of strange containers that you can attach to, the, to an already existing pod, accessing directly the same uh, namespace, the same process namespace of the uh, impacted container, and you can see, for example, which are the running processes. Of course, there are some disadvantages because if there are some threats, they can understand that you jumped into this kind of process namespace, container namespace, and so they may be dangerous sometimes, but useful if, for example, you have some distress image that don't have any kind of shell or tools utilities. And in a post-mortem analysis, you may also want to, for example, um, pull or extract the images that, that you, you previously committed and pushed in order to download it in another, in, into an analyzer machine. Um, you can so, uh, in this way you can see, for example, which were the changes in the file system. Or, and this is one of the best practices, of course, using the snapshot volume of the worker node that you have previously created, you can use that snapshot, uh, snapshot volume so that you can mount it into an analyzer machine. And from the analyzer machine, you can use tools like Container Explorer or Docker Explorer if you're using, uh, if you have previously used Docker in order to check which were the previously running containers. And I have here also this kind of video where uh, I'm showing how to use um, Container Explorer, it basically allows you to ch check which were the previously running containers in the previously snapshotted volume. And from that, you can understand, for example, that there was the Apache uh, impacted container. You can use the mount functionality so that you can mount the previously impacted container into the analyzer machine container. And from the analyzer ma machine container, you can range all the forensics processes that you want, all the forensic steps that you want. So at, at the end of all this video, you can see that I was able to successfully mount the container, the previously impacted container file system, and then see, for example, the TMP file system that um, was impacted by the affected container. But, Okay, oh, let's go ahead. And another interesting functionality that uh, works smoothly in Podman, but not in all the other container engine is container checkpoint. Uh, container checkpoint allows you to freeze the container state. So this also means container processes, container executions. So the file descriptors are opened by the, that by the processes themselves. Also some, also the TCP connections, for example, store them into an archive. And then you can later restore the container execution in a separated environment. So this is quite useful if you want to understand also at front time which kind of execution were previously launched into the, um, in, into the container that was impacted. By the way, 
this kind of feature, as I said, works mostly in Podman, but there are container engines that are trying to integrate it um, uh, as well. Uh, I think that there is also the Kubernetes checkpoint feature that is a beta, a, a beta feature right now, and allows you to checkpoint a container calling the kubelet request. It, it's still a work in progress, by the way. So at the end of this containment collection phases, of course you can do all the forensics processes that you want, but it is also important to understand um, if the attack spread elsewhere. So containers, as you know, may be run with privileged permissions, with sensitive mounts, and so this may allow attackers to escape from the container, from the pod to the host. You should always take care about the security settings, the security context that you create in your workloads. Here I posted, for example, two kind of security context um, and their analysis that was done by CubeScore that is another open source project. Of course, if we are talking about pods, pods by default are bound to uh, service account token, but I mean, most of the times these service account tokens are pretty generic and doesn't allow you to do that much. But if you create custom service account, um, you can communicate with the Kubernetes API server, create some new, uh, make some requests to the Kubernetes API server, create new resources, and technically also so, do some lateral movement to the, to the Kubernetes cluster. And of course, if you're talking about, for example, Kubernetes clusters, um, I mean, most of the time, whenever we create a Kubernetes cluster, its worker nodes are bound to IAM roles that have some privileges. And if you modify those privileges, assigning um, unrestricted access to some cloud resources, this may grant attackers to attack your cloud resources as well. And yeah, of course, the recovery, that I think it is one of the most uh, implicit kind of thing to do at the end of uh, an incident. So you have, of course, to fix the vulnerability if possible. Sometimes it is not always possible and you want to enforce some mitigation, like for example, workload, uh, like for example, delete the workload is, of course, is possible according to the services that you are providing or the workload that you have. Or also restore the container and hope that the attack doesn't happen again in the future, or enforce some, um, some playbook of actions whenever there is a kind of rule that is detected by, for example, Falco. You can enforce some, um, some specific playbook of action in order to say, hey, whenever there is this kind of rule that is triggered, kill my container. So uh, in order to wrap up this session, I'm now leaving the floor to Stefan again. So thanks, uh, Alberto, for all the information shared. And of course, the last uh, step that uh, required in the incident response plan is uh, post uh, incident activities. So uh, we took all the uh, action needed to contain, eradicate uh, the, the threat, and we restored and recovered the environment. Uh, and this is now back to normal and it's all working great. So that's fine. And it's now time to do some retrospective to get lesson learned from the incident. Some, there are some things that probably worked, other stuff that probably didn't work. So it's important to understand why they didn't work and what didn't work and perhaps uh, understanding uh, how we can do better. So the output of this, of, uh, of this phase is literally a kind of checklist of, uh, of points and a list point of uh, of what we need to improve. And this is basically the input for the, for the update of the, of the incident response that we have. So based on the feedback, based on what we discover during, during the incident, we can uh, update our incident, uh, uh, incident response plan, make it better, and be sure to avoid the same uh, incident in the future. So of course, what happened, happened, we can do much, but uh, we should uh, take this as a, a good opportunity uh, to do a better work in the future. Uh, so just to uh, wrap up uh, what we said and just uh, get some main uh, takeaways uh, take from this talk, 
So as I said, don't be caught unprepared. Uh, prepare your instant plan as soon as possible. Uh, as we said, this is fundamental. You need to be uh, prepared if something happens. Uh, uh, of course, um, uh, we need to respond as soon as possible. As we said, containers are ephemeral. Container uh, may not be there. Some activities need to be done when the container is still alive. So be prepared and uh, act as soon as possible. Um, the other point, as Alberto said, uh, containers are, aren't isolated by default, right, as we know. Uh, so there might happen like container escaping and, and the attack move to the, to the host or to the node or in other parts of, of your infrastructure. So don't just focus on the container that, that, that was exploited during your investigation, but go farther and there might be more to investigate. So be, be prepared of uh, not just looking the container, but also check all the rest of infrastructure, see the lateral movement, if there was something, and be prepared to go further in the investigation. Uh, and also, it's, it's important to have full, uh, uh, full, fully monitoring your, your infrastructure, so uh, be sure to have all the visibility that you need uh, in order to perform all the activities that we saw before. Uh, as we said, there are, and as we have seen, there are specific tools that we need to use, and we need to know how they work and which tool we need to use. As we said, there are a bunch of different tools, but we need to stay updated, and we need to know how to use them before the, the incident happens. Uh, also, it's actually important and is, is actually the best practice to uh, simulate bre uh, breaches uh, to see the response of the plan, of the people that are involved, to see if it's, it's working or if you, you, uh, you, need to involve, uh, you need to involve different people, perhaps, or update contacts or whatever. So check your plans. It's not enough to just create the plan and say, okay, we have done it. We need to check it, see if it's working. If not, update it and make sure that this is uh, working great as you expected and then uh, be ready for the, uh, for the real incident. And last but not least, um, as we have seen, uh, in order to do these kind of activities, or especially in the FIR for containers, but same for other technologies, uh, we need people that knows and have background on Kubernetes containers, but also instant response uh, knowledge. Sometimes, of course, uh, we don't have uh, the knowledge inside our organization or inside our team, so it's important to um, hire or engage someone else that has this kind of knowledge and can be and can do all these uh, activities in a good way, right? As we said, uh, in also in digital forensic, the, we need to uh, maintain the chain of custody, so it's important to do some uh, specific activities in a following best practice in, in good way so that we, we can use this data in, uh, in court or wherever it was. So it's not, we need to have this, um, uh, this knowledge and we need to do st uh, the old activities in, in a proper way. Uh, so I guess that's it from us. Thanks for joining. And I think we are actually run out of time, but if you have any question, we are here. Uh, we can answer offline if you have any question. Thank you very much.